All right, all right, all right. We're back on. I am excited to be doing this. The Collective Genius Code, our podcast has been thriving over the last few weeks, and I'm always excited to look into my network, to go deep, deep inside, to see who are those connections in life who made a big difference in my life, who made a big difference for our family. And I've seen them going through some sort of transition, some sort of a growth and development in front of me that I've appreciated and I've respected. My awesome guest today is someone who I've known since that moment that I decided that Singapore was gonna be home. I met him through the Professional Speaker Association. Very, very quickly I understood, not only is he gonna be the next president of the association, at one stage I kinda had that feeling, and I was right, I forecasted that, but I also understood that everyone sees him as a mentor. Everyone sees him as a leader who's kind of leads by example, a very beautiful man who, um, you know, has been a friend for myself and my wife since we got to Singapore, a family man, our kids have played together. And Frederick has always inspired me in the way he's done things as a speaker. Today, I'm very excited that he's going to be able to share with us a little bit more about his journey and some of the codes that he's been able to follow to bring him to a position where he's got an incredible bestseller book called The Idea Book. And I found out that this book is not just a book, but it's also a diary, kind of a beautiful thing. And he could share with us how he's managed to sell hundreds of thousands of copies of this book, just, you know, being very, very creative about it. He speaks about, you know, human creativity and how we really come out of our shell. He speaks about human essence in a very beautiful way. And he took me through a, an incredible um, kind of a, uh, I would call it a coaching, if you don't mind, Frederick, even though I know you don't like to refer, to refer to yourself a coach, but Frederick took me through a, a coaching session when we were on his island in Sweden and it helped me understand that networking was not one of my, my human essence, it was resourcefulness. And since that day, my life has truly, truly changed. He has spoken in over a thousand events around the world, over 70 different countries. I don't know many speakers who have done more than that. He's a father of three awesome kids that I've met and an incredible global speaker. It gives me an absolute pleasure to bring on today a, a good friend, a mentor, and an amazing, inspiring person for the world, Frederick Heron. Frederick, Thank welcome. You. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be on. Let's do this. Yeah, this is really, really amazing. You know, I, um, I always look for people who I believe could make a truly massive difference in the world now if I'm able to get their message across to a few more people. What would you say is your message? You have this ability to now talk to a million people. I wish I had a million followers, but what is that one message that Frederick Heron stands behind? Yeah, so we, we were talking about the session I did with you was to help you find your inner theme. And that an inner theme is as I define it, an inner theme is a, is a I, I believe every human being has a message inside of them. I kind of look at it as a, like if this was a huge movie, like a plot with seven point something billion people on it, uh, every character has some kind of a plot in the big story. And there's a message in every, every message has a story. So the idea is that if you find your own message in this story that you're telling, you, uh, life starts to resonate much more with you. And my inner theme is humanity to the power of ideas. So I, if I look back through my whole life, what I've been doing, what I've been passionate about, what I'm interested in, I can condense all of that into one phrase, humanity to the power of ideas. It means I believe in the potential of humanity and I believe in the power of human creativity. And that regardless of what I do, or, uh, or when I'm thinking of doing something, I can always go back and check, is this, in, is this aligned with my inner theme? And of course, uh, so that's the topic I speak on. So if I had a million people to speak to, I think I've, I've, I, I did realize I've spoken to more than, a million uh, more than a million people from the stage in my 20 years of speaking. And my message has always been that there's huge potential for, uh, for your, increasing your creativity in, in everyone, even the, the people who say they are not creative and the people who say they're super creative, everyone can become more creative. And when we become more creative, life, become more, life becomes more fun, more interesting, more, more rewarding, and, and the world becomes a better place. So that, that's, that's my message. 
That's awesome. I love that. I know that, you know, this topic is so relevant to everything that's happening in the world right now. And, you know, in, in, in recent months when uh, the world kind of got hit quite hard by COVID, the first thing I told my wife is like, we got to be creative. We got to think outside of the box. We got to be innovative. And like, it's funny when she came to me, she's like, what would Frederick do in this case? And that was really, that was a session we had together about like how important creativity is to come out of crisis. How have you seen in, in the recent months, how have you seen companies adjust to the, the current situation? Have they come to you and say, Frederick, help us be more creative? Or what have you, how have you seen creativity support companies maybe around you? Yeah, I, I, of, of course, this is a huge shock to the system for almost, almost everyone, not everyone, but almost everyone. And uh, I kind of look, we can start by looking how I, how, how I approached it. And I think it's important because it's very easy to think that creativity some, or innovation sometimes, somehow is connected straight to companies and that we need creativity to make better business. And we absolutely do. I mean, that's what I, when I go and speak at conferences, that's the message to them. How can this company become better at making money? or serving their customers or whatever it is. But it's also important to understand that creativity is much more than that. It is this, but it's much more than that. So when I sat down with my wife and we did the same exercise and said, okay, uh, we are gonna go, uh, I saw this quite early by the way, not because I'm not on Nostradamus or anything, but because we're based here in Singapore and, we're, and I'm a speaker. So speaking and assignments started to get canceled already in January. So I realized this is not gonna, this is gonna affect businesses so we could sit down very early and I even remember posting on some, some, for, some forums for speakers in other countries like Europe and America and, they were, and I was saying to them, sell all your stocks because this, this is going to tank in a few weeks. And they were just laughing at me and say, oh, this is all time high. I don't know what you're talking about. I said, okay, well, because Singapore, I live in Singapore and after China, Singapore was one of the first countries to get hit. So we could sit very early and, and kind of see what's going to happen. And then for the last few months, it's almost like we've been living in a time machine where you could see how the rest of the world would react a month or, or, or six weeks later. Like we were uh, hoarding toilet paper here, I think early February, and that, that hit Europe and America like a month later, right? So we sat down, me and my family, very early. It must have been, I think, even end of January. I'm not exactly sure. And we said, this, this, how is this going to affect us and what are we going to do? And I came, we, one, my biggest insight was that, as you said, we have three kids and said, our, my most important mission is that my kids remember this time as the most fun part of their life. Because then there's going to be a lot of stress. There's going to be a lot of bad news. There's going to be a lot of confusion. And there's going to be a lot of stress for a lot of people. And, and people are not going to take... So I decided, you know what? I'm going to spend more time with my kids and have them... Yeah, this is going to be... COVID is going to be fun. <laughs> and I said to myself, for the same reason for me. I want to come out of this healthier and happier than I came into it. So I've been spending a lot of time doing that because my, my idea is that business can go up and down but if we don't take care of ourselves and then that's much more a profound thing and if you look at what people are talking about right now they're talking a lot about like mental health and and domestic violence and child abuse and like all of these yeah. things have spiked and why because people didn't have take they didn't prioritize it they didn't prioritize it when the ship you know when the ship hit the fan or when the ship hit the rock they started prioritizing other things. And I'm not going to blame other people for what they choose to prioritize. But I said, I'm going to use my creativity to prioritize my own health and my children's well-being. And that, I've, I've spent a lot of time doing it. By the way, I'm, I've never been healthier uh, in my life than I am right now. <laughs> That's that amazing. I, I, I did notice on your social media that you're, you're running and you're keeping healthy. I love that. Similar to yourself, I understood them. Um, a long time ago, I'm saying from my, my, one of my good friends and mentors, Tony Robbins, that you want to see change in your world, start by changing your body. And mm. now four or five times a week, I got someone showing up at my house and he literally kicks my ass in really beautiful ways and gets me to like, you know, strengthen my body and my core is so much stronger so that I can get on any stage right now and rock it. So I love that you're showing very simple example of how you use creativity, first of all, to make your kids happy and not have to worry about everything that's going on. But now the, 
the Creativity Explorer, Frederick Heron. How, first of all, can you tell me what the Creativity Explorer is? Okay, so, so I talked about inner theme, and the inner theme is this universal message that everyone needs to hear, this story that is within you, and, and you're the best person on earth to tell this story to other people. So it's not only guides you, it's, 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 it's a, a message that guides you that you also want to share with others. So that's uh, my humanity to the power of ideas. But then the creativity explorer is my brand moniker. And the brand moniker is, is kind of, and a moniker, like, moniker is kind of like a nickname. So a brand moniker is it's like a nickname to my brand. And I used to define myself as a speaker for 20 years. But the last year, I, I, I've stopped defining myself as a professional speaker or author. If people ask me now, like if people used to ask me, Frederick, what do you do? I said, I'm a professional speaker and author on creativity and change. And that's what I said. But then in the last months, I started to change that. And in the last year, and now I, I said, if they ask me what I do, I say, I'm the creativity explorer. And, and actually, uh, I, got, I got this brand moniker from my son, which is a very cute story. So my son, Lucas, he's now nine. But when he was eight, he was asked to do a presentation in school. What does your parents do for a living? And he was supposed to say, my father is a creativity expert. But he somehow screwed it up. And he said, my father is a creativity explorer. And my wife was in the classroom at the, at the time. And she was like, Whoa, she called me on the phone. She's a brand strategist. She said, Frederick, you are not a creativity expert. You are the creativity explorer. And, the more, and then I started Googling, like, what's the etymology? What, what's the meaning of the word explore? And it literally means to venture into unknown territory in order to learn more about something. And that is exactly what I've been doing because as a speaker on creativity, I have made an effort to speak uh, in as many different industries and many different companies and as many different countries and cultures as possible, including like Bangladesh or Iran or North Korea or Myanmar, a lot of countries that most professional speakers would never go to, they have no interest, but I want to understand human creativity. So I've, I've decided I'm going to explore, I'm going to, explore uh, to, I'm going to find out the unknown things of human creativity by studying it in the places where we haven't studied before. So, uh, only, uh, of course, I go to Silicon Valley and I go to R&D departments and, and all of those traditional places, but I also want to learn about creativity from uh, totally unknown places. Today, I, got, I booked an interview with a, a guy who does, is a world record holder, holder in Mosaic, and he lives in Albania. I'm going to interview him, I think, next week. What can we learn about creativity from a guy in Albania who does m m uh, big Mosaic artworks? I want to find out. That's, that's the kind of thing I do. And then I, I take what I've learned and I spread it to the rest of the world. So I'm an explorer. I love that. And I know that uh, just in, in recent months, you launched a new book, The World of Creativity. I haven't launched it. I'm writing it. I'm actually writing three books at the same time. One is The World of Creativity, about what we can learn about creativity from different people and different cultures. It's kind of like food, right? Uh, food is food, but... Japanese food is very different from Italian food, which is the very different from, from uh, French food. So it's all food, but it's, we can learn from different cuisines. So I'm saying creativity is creativity, but we can learn about creativity. How is Chinese creativity different from Japanese creativity? How is Japanese creativity different from Italian creativity? It's all human creativity, but it's slightly different. And it's fascinating. The more you study this, you realize there's lots of slight variations of human creativity. And when, if you're really into food, you want to learn all about it. If you're really into creativity, you want to learn all about it. So that, that's what I'm putting together. And then, but that's just one of the books I'm writing. I'm writing, I, I like to write many books at the same time. It's much, uh, it's much more fun to wake up in the morning and not know which book you're going to write. So first of all, it's very, very exciting to know that you have a lot more incredible content that's coming up because I think that what we're going through right now in the world, people need that. But what if some people say, well, I'm not the creative type or... I'm not the creative one of the company or I hire someone that are creative, you know, should executives or, you know, my audience is mostly entrepreneurs and should entrepreneurs, doesn't matter what they do in the company. If they're the entrepreneur, this is my company. How can they, you know, should they be creative and how can they turn on their creativity meters? I don't know, whatever you call them. How do you, how do you do that? Uh, okay. So entrepreneurs, I love entrepreneurs. I've done a lot of talks for entrepreneurs. And uh, when it comes to entrepreneurs, the biggest problem with entrepreneurs is not that they don't think they are creative. Entrepreneurs almost per definition think they are creative. 
because they have this idea, almost all of them, they have this idea that this would change the world for the better, or I'm going to make a lot of money and by helping people, whatever makes you an entrepreneur, they have this idea and they think that this idea is better than everything that's already out there, or they're going to make it somehow better. So I've, I've, I've met very few entrepreneurs who say, oh, I'm not creative. The problem with entrepreneurs is they, somehow, they tend to over, uh, they are overconfident about their own creativity. And to me, that is actually sadder. It's very sad, the people who think they are not creative. And there's a lot of those people. They say, oh, I'm not creative. I'm not a creative type. Okay, that, that's sad. But it's even sadder, the people who are creative and who don't say to themselves, I'm going to become even more creative. I do the analogy with basketball. Like, if you are short, it's difficult to be good at basketball. It's not, it's not impossible. I think Stephen Curry is not that tall. You can be great at basketball if you're short, but it's hard. But if you're really, really tall, it's very, it, it, you're more inclined to be good at basketball. But just because you are good at basketball, um, just because you are tall, doesn't necessarily mean you're good at basketball. And just because, even if you are good at basketball and you are tall, if you decide not to practice, or not to go to the gym, you are not going to be as good as you could be. And the saddest thing to me is super creative people with a lot of creative potential who just kind of, ah, I'm, I'm, I'm creative, I, I don't have to try so hard. That's more pathetic to me. I think we should always, we should not say I am more creative than I'm the most, I'm the one top 1% 1 of creative people I know. We should not compare our creativity to anyone, but we should say, am I cre more creative today than I was yesterday? And if the answer is no, you should change something. Because it's such a waste. Imagine how much better your life could be if you decided to really uh, maximize your, your own creative potential. That's why my slogan that you can see in this slide, discover your full creative potential. That's what everyone should aim for. And, I can, uh, and none of us have reached it. None of us. Is there a specific life hack that you've learned that someone who's listening to us right now could, can do? What could I do today personally myself to, you know, let's just look at real cases. People are stuck, man. People like people come to me every day. I got a dancing school, Gil. It's a dancing school. I got a restaurant. I'm stuck. No business. I got this business, this business. And to me, sometimes like, well, I don't know, do dancing school online. It's like, it's, it's a simple kind of solution to iteration. Is there a specific, you know, algorithm or life hack or maybe a ritual, you know, that you think people could be doing every day to, 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 to wake up their creative senses and to help them step out of the current situation they're in? There are many, and I don't like to, to give one as in this is what you should do. Instead, to this question, instead, I like to ask people to think about their own creative process because, yes, a lot of us are not, a lot, a lot of people do not like to be stuck or to be cornered or to be uh, like be stuck in a problem or whatever, whatever we might feel right now. And we feel uncomfortable. Some people thrive on it. Some people become super creative when they are, have a problem. It's so they are, and they are doing great. So the most important thing you can do is not to learn a technique. I, don't, uh, I write books on creativity, but I don't teach one creativity technique. I teach a lot of different creativity techniques. So the most important thing you can do is to ask yourself, what's my own creative process? That's by far the most important thing you can do. When do you have your best ideas? Uh, for example, I know for a fact that I have my best ideas when I'm totally relaxed. So when I saw COVID coming, I said, you know what? I'm just going to, like I said, I'm going to go in and I'm going to be super relaxed. I'm going to, I have my best ideas when I'm relaxed, when I'm exercising, when I'm with my kids. Normally when I live on my, normally I, as you know, I go to my island in Sweden for two months. Unfortunately this year we couldn't do it, but I mean, I've built the same environment here in Singapore and I've spent the last two months doing, putting myself, or three, four months now, I guess, putting myself into this phase where I get my best ideas. The, the it's like a plant. What it, you can take a plant and you put it in the wrong soil or in the wrong environment, it will not grow. So instead of trying to do something, everyone else is, oh, you need to pivot. You need to right now quickly pivot. If you're not that kind of a person, you're not that kind of a seed. It's not going to work for you. You might be a person who says, well, it takes me six months to pivot. It takes me one year to pivot. I need to think my, I, I, I must, my ideas change slowly. Okay, good. Then say to yourself, one year from now, I will have pivoted. 
Don't try to, don't try to become something you're not. Instead, emphasize what you are. Think about what is the one, what are the few things that really triggers your creativity? What's the one thing that kills your creativity? For me, it's bureaucracy, politics. That's why I can't be in a big organization. I just couldn't do it. I, I would, I, I've tried it and I just die because so much negative, so much egg, to me, so much negative energy stops my creativity. It's like I'm always, someone's always turning off the engine. I like mm. to be all by myself and then work together with a lot of people in big companies. I call myself the ox pecker. You know, the ox pecker is that little bird that sits on top of the rhino and he feeds on the big rhino. He's part of the rhino almost. But as soon as he wants to get out of there, he's a, he's just flag off to go to the next rhino. I'm an ox pecker. I'm not the rhino. Nothing wrong to be the rhino. It's just not me. Hmm. So, mm -hmm. so self-realization, uh, self self-understanding is by far the most important thing you can, you can uh, dig into right now. And I know that this is something that you've been going very deeply into for many years. The, the, yeah. the inner theme that you've been able to, uh, to support people in understanding. And from, you know, the, the little I know about you, I know you've traveled all over the world from like North Korea to Afghanistan to really everywhere in the world. And, You've ever been to some really to some slums in the world where you know like where most people in the Western world will never go into, and you did that with this kind of passion to learn about human creativity and to interview all these people in corners of the world. What did you learn? Okay, to be honest, I have not been to Afghanistan yet, but I have an invitation on, uh, to go to Afghanistan, and soon I will. And I have interviewed people from Afghanistan, so just to be honest, to be clear. But North Korea, yes, and. And uh, yeah, you mentioned the slum. So I recently, recently, when could I, about six months ago, I went, yeah, December 2019, I went and interviewed some, some girls in the slums of Mumbai, in the, actually in the red light district of the slums of Mumbai, which is one of the largest red light districts in the world. And these are children of sex workers, basically. And 16, 17 year old girls with horrific stories about you know hiding under the bed when their sister is being raped and it, really terrible terrible life stories and i went to them because i said i want to learn something about creativity from them and normally it would be like we need to teach them right we need to teach them i said well, okay sure we need to teach them a lot but what can we learn from them and it's such an interesting experience actually it's very relevant to what you're talking about so i asked them i said Teach me something about creativity that I don't know. And then it, it took a while to kind of, because how do, you know what you, how do you know what you know that some other person don't know? Right? So we had a long conversation, one and a half hour. But at the end of it, they came up with something or they described something that I then named. No, they named it. They named it. Uh, they named it uh, Sufferender. Sufferender, which is a beautiful Suffering. concept. So what is sufferender? It's like suffer and surrender combined, yeah? It does not mean that you should surrender to your suffering. That's not what it means. What it means is that you should surrender to the, fa to the, the world you're in right now, to, to, to understand this is, it is what it is kind of a thing, right? So she said, for example, they were, <laughs> She was explaining, if I'm sitting on the streets of, of Bombay and I have no, I don't, I, for this night, I have nowhere to sleep. She could, I could sit and I could just cry and say, I have nowhere to sleep. Or I can say, you know what, tonight I don't have a place to sleep. So let's just sing songs and entertain each other. And then they, they would do that, right? And then they have this wonderful organization called Kranti. They work with these girls and they were able to get sponsored to fly them from Mumbai to Spain and do, uh, what's the name of it? Via Camilla, that, that, you know that walk that you, you walk for, uh, for 80 days from south of France to, to um, Barcelona, I think. It's like, a, one, it's like a pilgrimage that you do. And these girls went there and in, in the beginning of the, the first day of the trip, the, the, this woman organizing it, she, she said, okay, so girls, I'm sorry, we won't be able to do the whole walk because we don't have so much money. I mean, we could cover the trip, but that's kind of it. We don't, we'll make a few days, then most likely we have to stop. And the girls all looked at us and said, no, 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 that's the wrong mindset. We are going to walk as far as we can, and we are going to see if we can walk all the way. Because if we walk a little bit, and then we are 
and, and we feel terrible about the fact that we won't finish. We won't even enjoy the, the, the part that we actually do get to walk. So instead they say, you know what, let's enjoy it as long as we can and walk as long as we can. And of course, they, will, will, they would walk up to strangers. They would say, like, hi, we're children of, of sex workers from Mumbai. We're trying to find a new life. We have nowhere to sleep. Can you give us some money? And people just threw money at them. They did the whole walk. And then I asked them, okay, give me a message to, to a Westerner, like someone who, like say a struggling artist in New York. <laughs> and the, she said, you know what, first of all, you're, you're not struggling. You have a home, you have food, you're, you, 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 like no one, is, uh, no one is attacking you, you're, you're fine, stop complaining. And then she said, like, oh, but I'm a struggling artist, I, I have to work as a waitress, but I want to be on Broadway. I said, stop that. Instead, tell yourself, surrender to the fact you're not on Broadway right now, you're a waitress. Now be a really good waitress, so you get a lot of tips, and then use the tips to play for acting school, and for, for a while be, an, be a great actress who is going to night school to learn to become an actress so she can go to um, Hollywood or, or, uh, or, the, or the stage, right? Sufferender to where you are right now and enjoy it instead of suffering for something that there's no reason to suffer for. It's a beautiful message. That's amazing. I love that you're able to get such profound messages and such awesome stories, which I hope all in your book from, I don't want to say you random people in the world, but I think you, do, you don't really have a, like, you don't look for famous people. You don't look for someone that you can find on Google. You don't look for someone that was recommended. You, how do you find these people? I'm curious. It's called the internet. You can find anyone on the internet. I, I do also, I mean, I, I interviewed hundreds of heads of innovation of like some of the largest companies in the world, uh, Roche and I just interviewed the head designer of Ford and I, I do all of that as well. I mean, I, it's not that I deliberately go after not famous people. I have this idea, as you remember, my inner theme is humanity to the power of ideas. It's humanity to the, I believe everyone could be, could be much more creative. And I believe a lot of, and I, and I truly believe that everyone can teach you something. So I will, I will approach, I think you, you can, I can go and talk about creativity with a taxi driver and I can talk creativity with heads of state. And I think all of them can t teach me something. And when you have this, let's call it humble, humble curiosity, it's, 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 it's amazing the things that you can learn. Is there something that you've um, realized, you know, now... You know, we're in the middle of 2020 going through a massive change in the world. Are there people who have a higher chance of developing their creativity maybe because of age group? Is that something you've seen? I, I don't know. I, maybe this is not a direct answer to your question, but I think... So we just started homeschooling our kids hmm? because... <laughs> In Singapore, they closed the school down for two months because of COVID, and now they're gonna, they say they're going to open again, but who knows, right? So we said, you know what? We'll just homeschool them for a year and see how it is because they might close them anyway. But then we realized this is the most amazing, this is the most, it's the most creative project I've ever, ever done, homeschooling our kids. And I, I just actually looked up the etymology of school. Do you know what school means? The, the meaning of the word school? No. It means a place of learning. So I realized, I said to my wife, we are not homeschooling our kids. We should not say that we are homeschooling our kids because if homeschooling means school is now the place for learning, right? So instead, we are saying that we are surf schooling our kids. We look at the whole, we look at the internet as our school. And we, like, for example, we have signed up a one-on-one -on -one Indian tutor to teach math to our kids. We have signed up a, a an, a, a, an English teacher in the Philippines who do a few hours of online teaching to our kids. And I go, I go out and I, I, I'm soon going to interview the head of a Swedish champions of soccer because my son is a soccer fanatic and we're going to do an interview with him about what my son should think about if he wants to become a successful soccer player. This is the head, the head uh, the, not the head coach, but the, uh, one of the coaches of the Swedish National Championships of Soccer teaching my school as a teacher for 15 minutes, but who cares, right? And then, my, then he's going to say, oh, you really need to be good at analytics. Okay, good. Then we Google, who is good at, good at analytics? And I'm teaching my son that there's a billions of people out there and you can reach anyone 
So the whole idea of school being a place you go to, and uh, okay, okay we, all, we had that experience when we went to the library, like the, every, a book can teach us everything. But this generation, they are growing up with, uh, there are billions of people who can teach you anything. And they are growing up with this mindset and you know, I can reach out and ask them. And we're doing that now. So when I, I, I just interviewed uh, this woman in Afghanistan who does traditional Afghan art, uh, like they used to do in a uh, thousand years ago to the kings. She paints with gold and she grinds gemstones into powder, which takes her a month until she has grind, grounded, ground enough gemstones to paint one small miniature painting. So she makes her own paint, it takes her a month. Then she makes her own paint, paint brush by cutting the hair of a cat, putting it on a feather of a bird, tying it up together. Then she makes her own paper. It takes her two months before she can even start to paint, right? So we talked about what can we learn about creativity from someone who takes two months to prepare. Actually, the lesson is profound patience. That's the lesson and how the creative process in her brain, while she's doing that for two months, the, the creative process, what am I going to paint? What am I going to paint? What am I going to paint? Goes on for two months before she paints. So when she actually starts painting after two months, it's nothing like what she thought she was going to paint two months when she decided to start painting something. But she said, you in the West, you buy paper, you buy, you buy paint, you buy brush, you go home, you paint, and you paint the first thing that pops into your head. I had two months to change my idea. And then, she, then I <laughs> recorded this video and they said, uh, okay, that was a great interview. Now give me a message to my kids. And she looks into the camera and she says, Maria, Sofia, and Lucas, uh, 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 it takes me two, one month to make enough paint to make, paint the painting. Never underestimate the power of patience. And she gives this short lecture for like five minutes, three, three and a half minutes. But then I show her the videos of her paintings and everything beforehand. So they get all excited about her. Then I show this three and a half minutes when she's talking straight to them this amazing Afghan artist teaching my kids about the patience when it comes to art. That is, that's the world we're living in now. And 99.9% .9 of children or adults haven't understood that that's the world we live in now. I love, uh, I love hearing you speak because you get very excited about people's ability to be creative and people's ability to be resourceful. That's a very beautiful uh, human trait, I believe. But I guess that can I assume that you are someone who deals with problems in a very easy way? I, well, I don't know. I kind of, I'm assuming that you have creative ways of approaching problems. And I would love if, if you have, you know, the world is now going to be full of problems and people need to be more resourceful and more creative when they see problems and like a good entrepreneur, see an opportunity there and do something about it. Yeah. Do you have something you could share that you would say how maybe you look at problems or challenges and how do you switch them into opportunities? Okay. Like you did with the kids in the school and everything. That's amazing. Okay. So I am actually extremely unresourceful and I, I am also very, quite a lazy person and I'm not productive. I, there's, there's a lot of, and I'm not. That's hard to believe by the way. And I'm not structured. There's a lot of things going against me, to be, I really have to say. But the thing that I do have, this is, so this is my technique, is I call it the elevator, uh, the elevator to, to take the elevator. And uh, so a lot of people, they, they take the stairs. They, they think they have to grind and then walk up the stairs and hard work. And I don't believe in hard work. I believe in, in, in I, do, I believe in work, I believe in productive work, I believe in getting things done, but I don't believe in necessarily in hard work. So the elevator, I believe in professional work, but that's totally different than hard work. Uh, so the elevator idea is that I will stand on the platform, like the ground floor, and I'll just wait for the elevator to come. I can just sit and wait and do, I'm like a, I, use, I do the analogy of a, of a lion. I'm, 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 I'm throwing metaphors at you. <laughs> but the lion, for 22 hours per day, the lion sleeps. And for one hour per day, it has sex. And for less than one hour per day, it actually hunts. But when it hunts, it hunts like crazy, right? 
So it's actually mostly, li mostly lazy, but when it goes after something, it goes after something full on. And same with the elevator. You stand there, you wait, and you wait, and nothing happens. And suddenly the elevator opens. And when the elevator opens, I, it's only open for a sh short period of time. I jump in and I press the button and I go as far as I can. And when it opens, I jump out and then I wait again. But if you just hesitate for a second when that elevator opens, because that, you know, inside there might be, a, I don't know, a gorilla or something, and you go, ah, I'm not so sure about this. And then the elevator closes, you'll never go anywhere. So uh, you mentioned the word opportunity. It's my favorite word. I'm a fanatic when it comes to etymology. And I love to tell this story. Do you know what the word, uh, do you know what the word opportunity means? In English? No, like the etymology, the origin of the word. I don't. Okay, yeah. So school means a place of learning. But, but, but what's the etymology of, of uh, opportunity? So opportunity is a name of a wind. You know, you have a typhoon, you have a storm, you have a hurricane. Many different winds I mean, have different names, right? And opportunity was a very special wind. It's from the, the Romans, the Roman from 2000 years ago. The Romans, when they were out on the Mediterranean Sea and they were on the boats and they'd been out for like weeks and weeks or something, and suddenly they were in the doldrums. There were no wind and they were like starving or dying almost. And then suddenly opportunity came. And opportunity literally means the wind that takes you back to your harbor. Wow. How beautiful, how beautiful is this? So you're, imagine you're on this ship and there's no, no wind and we're dying in this, the, hot, the hottest sun and suddenly someone says, opportunity. The wind, and not just any wind, the wind, that, the right wind, the one that takes you back to your harbor. And what's the lesson? The lesson is that when opportunity comes, what do you have to do? You can't just sit there and say, thank you, opportunity. You need to stand up, hoist the sails, get the sails up, and you need to sail, use the wind to get home. Otherwise, you won't get there. So opportunities don't do anything. Opportunity, to, opportunity opens itself up, and then you sail the opportunity. Or in the elevator case, uh, jump into the elevator, the elevator takes you up. So I think it's a beautiful metaphor. So I'm an opportunist. I'm not an, I take opportunities. All right. Well, I, I would say that uh, for people out there who have problems around them, what I did, you know, when COVID hit, uh, what I did because, you know, my business completely stopped, business, events business, tourism business, it completely stopped. The first thing I did in order to wake up the creativity around me and inside of me, I reached out to people around me who are creative, people around me who are like very successful entrepreneurs, who I knew were being creative as, as we speak. And I just listened to them to ask them what they were doing. I was just curious to know, you know, and I, you know, you speak about the inner theme. I wanted to know what's their inner drive. I wanted to know what's doing it for them right now. You know, they came to this exact same um, you know, stop sign as we all did because we all kind of got hit in a very similar time. I wanted to know how other people around me are, you know, driving around these hurdles and driving around the, the bumps on the road that could potentially really uh, to, to harm any business. Hmm. Is, is there something out there that you would say if someone is being creative right now and they're in flow and they're supporting their business, they're finding these opportunities that are, are leading them to the right direction, is there something that you've seen that really kills creativity? Or uh, if there's something that kills creativity or someone who's really killing it with creativity? Um, interesting, interesting, very different question. Um, let's look at both of them. What, what potentially would kill creativity in a team of people or in a company? What should you know, entrepreneurs be worry of? If, with, like they could see themselves maybe talking to a person or doing something that would maybe kill creativity and it would stop them from thriving during challenging times. So there, I get that question a lot. What kills creativity? And if I ask the question back to the group and say, what do you think kills creativity? The most common answer is fear. So, so that is, that is a, a very common answer. I'm not necessarily sure it's the right answer. I mean, it's not wrong. A, a lot of people are, a lot of people feel that when they are afraid, their creativity gets killed. So it's not the wrong answer. But I think there is a bigger, uh, something that kills creativity more. And that is what I call like red tape, bureaucracy, indifference, 
like when, when someone really feels, because if I turn the question around and I say, when do you feel the least creative? People do not say when I'm afraid. So you see the difference? So when I say, when do you feel the least creative? People say, oh, like when I'm in a, when I'm in a, a, a place with too many rules or when I'm always constantly being stopped or when no one listens to my ideas. None of that is fear. So, so I find that more interesting. So I think from an entrepreneur perspective, I wouldn't say, what can I do to reduce the fear of my people? I would say, what can I do to reduce the, the feeling of, of my creativity being drained out of you? Which, for example, could be bureaucracy or too many rules or, or too, much, too much micromanagement or someone looking over your shoulder all the time and, and, or too many processes being too... I, too complicated. I just listened to the interview with the founder of Netflix and the, how about they introduced a vacation policy like that they have no policies like that they can take as much vacation as you want. Just make just make a, uh, I think they say make a decent decision or make the right decision or something like this. And you don't have to apply for anything. And same same for spending money up to, at least up to a certain amount. Just spend the money responsibly or something. The rule is something like that. And I think it's great. So. It, Yes, a lot of people freeze and when they are confused and a lot of people have been confused and maybe not been so creative, but it's not the number one thing. The, one, the number one thing is what I just mentioned, the, the red tape and the bureaucracy and the, mm. the, the board, the, not boredom. Boredom can actually be good for creativity, but it's this feeling that it's, it's meaningless or no one listens, no one cares. Then we... I well, okay. Yeah. I, I, I have found in, in really good mastermind sessions and brainstorming sessions what kill creativity is someone who just says what doesn't work. If you know, I, I find that the best creative sessions are where any crazy ideas are discussed. The craziest and wildest ideas are discussed. I see that someone in one of our chats was just asking about uh, specifically drugs, but specifically marijuana. But I would say that uh, I would I'd like to ask you, you know, it, have you read or uh, of maybe through the different cultures that you've experienced? Because some people say that alcohol, for example, would kill creativity, whereas opposed to some other drugs would maybe open up creativity. Have you seen in some cultures where people potentially use substances, use specific foods maybe to open up creativity inside of them? Okay, so yeah, so it's not that easy because, uh, for example, if you ask people when do you have your best ideas, a lot of people, uh, uh, a lot of people, maybe up to 10, 20 percent, will say when they're when they're drinking alcohol. So for some of them, it's really great. Let let's get together a few people, let's have some wine, let's brainstorm some ideas, let's go to a nice place. So uh, for some people, that's really really good. Uh, for other people, it, make, it just creates a lot of really stupid ideas and they look, the day after they look at it and they think it's stupid. So I, I'm very nervous to say that, yes, this works or that doesn't work. So for me, I, I don't get very, uh, drugs doesn't help. I mean, alcohol, for example, doesn't help me get, get better ideas, but I'm not going to say it's not going to be good for anyone. I, someone told me Stephen King has all his good books he's written when he was drunk, all his bad books he's written when he was sober. I don't know if that's true or not. But I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, so uh, yeah, there and and there are a lot of there are a lot of different ways of tricking the brain. To and if you think about it, what is creativity? It's kind of it's a way of tricking your conscious brain, right? And you can trick your brain with drugs, or you can trick your brain. For example, you could meditate, or or uh, you can go to a, a place where your brain feels very uncomfortable, or you can go to a culture which is totally new to you. I remember the first time I went to Japan, I felt like I was on, literally, I felt like I was on a drug. My, I couldn't for the first two days in Japan, and for the first two days when I came to China, I moved to China in 2005. I remember it very clearly. For the first two days, I couldn't speak because there was no output. There was so much, diff, there was, the, the input was just so weird so different eating uh, not just chopstick but like everything like you go to tokyo and you go what the hell is this place and the brain is so confused that the conscious brain is like uh, okay i'm going to turn off for a while and we're just going to figure out what the hell is going on and then i'm going to come then i'm going to come with my report so for two days i was i was high i didn't take any drugs or anything but i felt and i was i was super creative 
Because, not that I came up with ideas then, but because my conscious brain decided to turn off, I saw things. I was, I was, I was noticing a lot of things. I was, uh, I was, I was upset. I, I just, I was paying attention so much. I, I was observing things, not following people, all these kind of strange things that I normally wouldn't, that I would never do. I've been in Singapore for 10 years. That, that is gone here. It's gone here. I, I, I know this place so well. So, so I love that. I, I, I used to do that a lot as well. Whenever I needed a boost to creativity, I would either go to a city that was new to me, a country, I would travel. I would go walking around and just getting lost in the, in the streets or sometimes in malls, wherever there's something that's brand new. So I'm assuming first time you come to China, you're like, whoa, this is all brand new. Creativity starts popping up. That's really cool. Yeah. Is there... Is there a specific industry, you know, if we're looking at, you know, you went into the inner theme uh, of humans. If we're looking at the inner theme, maybe if that, if that's a thing of industries, is there an industry out there that you've seen that has not enough creativity or has massive potential for, to become a lot more creative and innovative in the coming years ahead of us? Oh, okay. I, I, for sure, I'm going to say the food industry. The food industry is the next big one. Unbelievable, unbelievable what's happening. Um, literally unbelievable. There's a Finnish company called, oh God, Sun Life, Sun Power, Sun, 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 and I forgot the name. But they have figured out a way to make food using electricity, like solar cells, not a lot, like electricity, air, and an enzyme. That's all you need. An enzyme that grows by itself, air and electricity. You are literally making food out of thin air. It uses something like hundred or hundreds of times less energy and hundreds of times less space than traditional food production. It out comes a powder that looks like flour, has no taste. And so you can mix, you can take that powder and throw it into any other food and you have now protein that you can live on and, and so all the there it could you could feed astronauts on it to, we don't they don't need to have food in space anymore they can just create the food on the spaceship but imagine we can also feed it to the cows now we can stop cutting down Brazil, the rainforest and we can just feed, create this food out of nowhere feed it to the cows and eat the steak if we want to that's one of them and then there's another another one i just read about who's creating milk vegan milk by having a fungi that if you take milk and you cut it up into what is actually milk, like what is the ingredients of milk, and you, you dig into it and you realize, okay, but this thing is also created by this fungi, and now they, they, this fungi is now used to create some, it's not milk, but it's the same consistency, it's the same material as milk is. You can now do, uh, you can buy it, and it's on the market already. You can buy uh, uh, ice cream that, vegan ice cream that tastes and looks and has the consistency of milk made with milk because it's, it's the same ingredients, it's just not made with milk. So we don't need the cow anymore. And I just saw that Kentucky Fried Chicken is going to launch chicken nuggets, 3D printed chicken nuggets. They're gonna, they, they're gonna grow cells and then wow, print them. Wow, that's weird. And so it's, it's, it's chicken nuggets made out of chicken, but not made out of chicken. And you know, on and on and on. It's unbelievable what's going on. And I'm not saying oh, I want to eat all of those things, but I think it's amazing because we will have a problem feeding humanity the way we have been feeding it. And these are really crazy in innovation. And I love it because it's an COVID, industry. So COVID definitely pushes people in the food industry to become more creative and innovative because they got a ship to the house, they got a better packaging, definitely food. What other industry do you most believe in that will now explode ahead of us that, ha that needs someone like you to come in and work with them and say, guys, look what you're leaving on the table. Okay, so I do a lot of, I do all kinds of industries. I do um, uh, oh, literally cars and travel, whatever. I did a speech once for a, not recent, uh, not long ago for a shipping company. And I said, okay, give me the brief. And they said, oh, so I said, I'm guessing you're being disrupted because everyone is being disrupted right now. And I'm guessing you're being disrupted. And the guy said, oh, no, 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 this is shipping. Not, no one is being disrupted here. And I said, okay, that, that tells me something. That tells me that shipping is the next one to be disrupted. <laughs> so the, the longer an industry has not been seeing innovation, the bigger the chance, it's like an earthquake. The longer there hasn't been an earthquake, the bigger the chance it's gonna be a big one. 
So, uh, so uh, I, I don't think you cannot look at it. Oh, I said, that's a traditional industry. <laughs> I have a great story about this, about uh, a, I did a speech for a company that makes screws, you know? No, no, sorry, not screws, nails. You know, hammer, hammer and nail. And this, this, if we have time, I'll share it with you because they have been making nails for 300 years, okay? They've been around for 300 years. And now they're going to celebrate their 300th anniversary and by inviting the customers and they wanted me to speak. So they said, Frederick, and then I said, well, okay, I would love to come. What do you want me to speak about? And he said, I want you to speak about innovation in the nail industry. <laughs> I go, no, what? that's a five, that's a five second speech. There's no innovation in the nail industry. The nail hasn't changed for 5,000 years or 2,000 years. And then he said, no, it actually it has. It's, the nail industry after thousands of, or hundreds of, well, let's say thousands of years, more or less no change. And then suddenly because of the nail gun, the nail industry totally transformed because with a nail gun, you have to have a specific nail that fits with a specific nail gun, right? A any hammer can use any nail, but in a nail gun, it has to fit with a nail gun. It's like a printer and a, and a cartridge. So th the packaging changed, the marketing changed, the product changed, uh, the, the design of the nail changed, the client changed, the, everything changed for the people who made nails because now they send all the nails to Black & Decker. Black & Decker puts Black & Decker on top of it and then they, they dis distribute the nails through their, through their network. So I said every aspect of the nail was, was changed because someone invented the nail gun. So if, you can if the nail industry can be disrupted, any industry can be disrupted. I was talking to someone the other day about um what happened when, uh, when COVID really hit, a lot of people ran to get toilet paper. And it was a little bit of a funny joke. If people went to get the better quality toilet paper or any kind of toilet paper, has toilet paper had any much innovation or is there any kind of room for creativity there? Uh, I, I have been speaking to people who do uh, toilet paper and diapers. And the, the, most, the, the most fun story around that industry is I did a speech for a company that makes coffee, that they, make, they make toilet paper, but they also make coffee filters. So then they had this idea that, you know, paper is actually bleached, right? It's not, they need to bleach it to make it white. And now if you think about it, you put a coffee filter into a coffee machine and then you throw coffee on. As soon as you start using it, it becomes black or dark brown. So why on earth are we bleaching something that will be brown one second after we use it? So they said, why don't we just do unbleached coffee filters? But they didn't know if it would work. So to, to, work, to do it, they, they, they took paper and they colored it brown and then they made coffee filters and, they saw, and then they tried to sell them and say, will people buy brown coffee filters? And they did. And then they said, okay, now let's, let's buy, let's buy uh, uh, unbleached coffee filter paper because there was no on the market. So they had to create artificially unbleached paper from bleach paper to make, to show that it actually would work. And now I, I don't know, but a lot of paper, a lot of coffee filters are not bleached anymore because it's a stupid idea to bleach something that literally never uh, shouldn't be bleached at all. But in the beginning, they actually had to create it. I think you have a very uh, exciting and fun life because you're able to work with so many organizations around the world and, help them, you either help, you help, they help you see creativity in their business, which is probably the most exciting work ever to see how every industry is developing. But I'm also assuming that you help them see a lot of very simple steps and creativity and how they could do things. And, you know, I remember when you were telling me about um, you launching your, your journal, the idea book. Um, and I guess that journaling in general is quite important for creativity to to write down progress, to see, you know, what, what, what happened that got us to be creative as a company, as an individual. Tell us a little bit about your, your, the idea book. Uh, yeah, there it is. <laughs> so I, a, I have one of those, but I have the white one. Ah, there's a special, that's a special edition. There's only a thousand other white ones. So you are very privileged to get one of the white ones. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so it's a book in a notebook. It's 150 pages about creativity, and then it's 150 empty pages for you to write down your ideas in. And but it's very important. To, so yes, I do believe writing your ideas down is very important. 
for a lot of people, again, not for everyone, but for a lot of people, it really helps them. Leonardo da Vinci was one of those people. Uh, I'm one of those people. Mo a lot of people are like that, but not everyone. But people use the idea about, what I found interesting is that people use it in many different ways. So some people buy it as an instruction manual and they use the white pages to write down because every chapter ends with an exercise. So they use it as an exercise book. They do the, the white pages and they, they do the exercises. They follow the instructions. Some people use it to use it like a normal, like a, a journal, write down everything that happens some people use it to only write down the best ideas. Like I have people who said, I'm only writing ideas down for the new business I'm starting. Or I use my idea book to plan my wedding or something like this, like only specific ideas. The, the priest here in Singapore, she's gone now, but she had two books on her, on her desk next to her bed, the Bible and the idea book. And you know, they, they look exactly the same. So every Sunday she has to come up with a new sermon, right? Or every Saturday she has to come up with a new sermon. So she would read the Bible and then when she had an idea, she would write that idea down in the idea book. So that was her way of keeping sermon ideas is what she used the idea book for. Some people use it as a gift to give it away to their very creative friends to like, say, I think you're a creative person. You should have the idea book. Some people give it to the, their friends who are not creative and say, I think you need to be more creative uh, or uh, here's a book to teach you how to become more creative. And I'm telling you this to say that there's not one product. It's a book, it's a notebook, it's an inspiration, it's a gift, it's a training material, it's a corporate gift. It's, so it is, it's one thing I did, but I can sell it in many different ways, which is a very good example of, of using creativity to, to, well, in this case, broaden the market. I think it's, it's one of the greatest creative ideas I've ever seen in someone launching something as simple as a book, because from the statistics I remember, the average book out there in business or, you know, kind of personal development only sells about 700 copies in its uh, lifetime. Uh, I think it's 3000 for business books and 400 for novels, but I know there's many, not, there's no exact number, but roughly like yeah, a couple of thousand copies and you, you are, you are above average. Yes. And you and, basically uh, came up with a super creative way to sell how many books already? Uh, more than 200,000. And the reason I do it is because I go to companies and I, I don't ask them to buy my book because every other speaker would say, would you also like to buy my book? And most, mostly they don't. But I say, when they booked me for a speech, I said, oh, wouldn't it be nice if also they had a notebook so they could write down all the brilliant ideas they get during this conference so, we don't, so that you don't forget the ideas during this conference. And then they say, I actually written a book, which is a book and a notebook. And, and then they buy, you know, 500 copies. I had one client buy 14,000 copies to distribute to, through a conference. That's three nice. times or four times more than the average author sells in his lifetime of his book. And I have, I've, uh, and I have uh, multiple clients buying thousands of copies of the book to give away because they're not buying it, they're not buying it on the book buying account. They're buying it on the stationary account, which is much bigger. <laughs> mm. Simple, simple act of creativity creates uh, that beautiful of return on investment. If for the listeners out there today, the, the entrepreneurs just like myself and also yourself, I know you've been an entrepreneur for a big part of your life. And what is that question? If an entrepreneur had you in front of them right now, uh, I know that, you know, you don't come cheap to come into a company and speak in front of them, but they have, they had an opportunity to have you in front of them. What is that most important question that people should be asking you connected to creativity, connected to the creativity explorer himself that would most help them right now move forward in their business? I actually also do one-on-ones. So, so I, and I think my spontaneous answer to that is that my, my, my initial answer was that I, I, I'm not going to answer that question. I'm not going to say what question they should ask me. Instead, I would ask them to have a conversation with me and then see which question comes up. My, my, after, I, I think I've done 200, the last three years, I think I've done 200 one-on-one -on -one sessions with, with 200 different people. And my big insight after doing this is that you need to go on a, like a conscious, conscious deep conversation. 
as quickly as possible, go as deep as po possible in a conversation. You can go, it's kind of like those people who go diving, the ones who just hold on to a weight and just drop. And they can go so, before they have to go up and breathe, they can go down to, I don't know, whatever the world record is, 60 meters or something. And then they go up again because they focus so much on going deep. But most people just kind of go around the surface. And most, most conversations are like this. They don't go deep enough, fast enough. And they're not interested in going deep. And, but when you have a conversation like a, a conscious and deliberate deep conversation with someone, you can go so deep. And then it's impossible to say, what's the, what is that profound question that you should ask? You don't know that in the beginning. You know that after one hour. And that's when you, so, so the only purpose in the first hour, first 59 minutes is just to find the questions you need to ask in order to get to the most profound question after an hour. So it, because that's very much the creative process as well. People are, are um, hooked on this idea that they need to come up with an idea. But if, if you think you're on the surface and you quickly try to come up with an idea, it's going to be a shallow idea. Instead, talk about the problem, discuss the problem from different perspective, from different per people's perspective, go deeper. Well, what's the problem of the problem? Why is this a problem? Boom, 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 boom. And you go really, and why is, this, why is this a problem for you? Why do you care about this? Ding, 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 ding. Quick, quickly, I interrupt the people all the time when I do this thing. No, no, deeper, 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 deeper. And then one profound question and they go, boom. And uh, that's the answer I wanted to find. Then, bam, done. But so, yeah, so it's very important that, that uh, someone should write, a, I, won't, I won't do it, but someone should write a book about profound, deliberate, deep conversation. Well, for me, profound and deliberate, you know, um, networking is, is something I'm, I'm very fond of. And, you know, you, you speak about asking important questions, and I know that you've mentored countless amount of companies and speakers around the world. And, you know, a, a topic that's very important to me are masterminds and this uh, ability to surround yourself with people who can guide you and grow you and support you like there are masterminds within the speaker association and other industries. Um, we, we're, we're huge believers that masterminds are an important part of the future of the world to allow people to collectively come up with creative solutions, collectively, you know, co-elevate each other. Um, what is your opinion of the future of masterminds and how do you think they can help people with creativity? I love what, I love what you guys are doing. I think it's great because that's, you're basically doing the, what we've just been talking about here and having people help each other and go deep and really and in, a, in a safe environment where, where people have the same interest and the same ambitions and the same, maybe not the same purpose, but at least aligned purposes and so on. I, I think it's, yeah, there's so many of these things. I, you asked me earlier, like, is there any industry that is more creative or something? I think the biggest difference now in the world is how many hundreds of billions of people who didn't have a chance to learn any of this before. Let's talk about a, a village in, in Pakistan or something like this. It, uh, I mean, I love Pakistan. It's one of my favorite countries, but I'm not using, I'm not, talking down about Pakistan, but the, now you can sit there and say, you know what, I want to learn about masterminds. And then you can do that, right? It was impossible only 20 years ago, and now it is possible. Or I'm in, I don't know, in Namibia, I want to learn about creativity. Or I'm in California, I want to learn about meditation. And you, you go and learn from someone in India, either way, right? So these tools that suddenly humanity got access to, uh, it, it, the, to me, the most important, the most fascinating thing is how many people in the world can now get access, access to these tools like a mastermind. It, the potential is just unbelievable if you think about how much, how much empowered these people are going to become for the people who are building these tools. I, uh, I appreciate the answer. And if we go a little bit deeper, connected to masterminding and you know, asking for help, if myself and everyone in the community that's currently listening, if we were able to help you with something, Frederick, and we work right now in a mastermind, what would you ask us for help with? I'm just, oh, I'm, I'm not good at this. I'm, I'm the other way around. I'm a deflector. I, I, what can I help you with? <laughs> you, you, you caught me off guard there. I, 
uh, can you go back to that question? You can ask that question as the last question before we're done. Is this the last question or you throw me some other ones and I come back to it? I need to think about this. This is too important to just give you a stupid answer. I, I know, I know. I like asking people though. We went a little bit over time here with our normal session because I was just enjoying it. We are not, there is no specific timing. Um, I didn't have more, well, I had a lot more questions, but I thought this would be kind of a, a, a good, nice question. It's a good final to, question. Yeah. To, I was just finalize to... with, unless, unless again, a question I can always ask you, but I don't think you'd answer it. Is there a question that I haven't asked you that I should have asked you that's going to be the biggest value for everyone? You asked me that question, actually, when I gave a speech in front of the APSS community a couple of years back. That was you, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that is, uh, that, that is a good question. Uh, I don't know. I, I'll take whatever came into my head right now. So the, whatever, the question you should ask me is something about... Uh, Okay, uh, racing mixed children. What have you learned by racing mixed race children? That's, that's mm -hmm. a question. I don't know if it's, I think it's, I think the answer will be re re relevant even if the question doesn't sound relevant. But that's the question that came into my head from my subconscious. So I'm going to say the one that popped into my head. Doesn't make sense maybe, but that's the one I want to, that's the one I want you to ask. I, I love it. And I think it definitely is very much aligned with the creativity explorer. Yes. Okay. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to answer it now or? Yeah, please. All right. Uh, what did I learn by raising mixed race? So my wife is from the Philippines. I'm from Sweden. I used to live in China. I used to live in America. And now we live in Singapore. And the, the thing that we learned, what the, thing, the epiphany for me is that if I would have married a Swedish woman as a Swedish man living in Sweden, we would have raised Swedish kids. And we wouldn't even have considered, we wouldn't even have thought about what that meant. It's just natural for us. But now, because I live in a different country and I married a person from a third country, we now have uh, uh, different ways of doing anything or well, almost not everything, but a lot of things we can do very differently, including what are we going to eat for dinner? Right? We're going to have meatballs or are we going to have adobo? So, so in Sweden, we would eat meatballs. <laughs> we, would not, uh, we would eat pizza and sushi and stuff. We wouldn't eat adobo. Right. So, but also more profound things like how are we going to raise, how are we going to raise our kids? And my, my wife is not a tiger mom, not at all, but, and she's, she has, but she has this traditional Filipino way of how you raise kids. And I have the Swedish way, which is all very, very different. I have to say, Swedes, it's more, uh, more about, you know, give power to the kids, listen to the kids. Filipinos are more like, we need to, we need to raise the kids. That's what parents do. And we had, a, we had a discussion this morning about home, like homeschooling. How are we going to tell our kids that they need to focus on getting back into school, right? Like they need to jump into school in the morning. We don't have a teacher anymore. You have to take responsibility of your own schoolwork. And we had the discussion, like, how do you teach this to the kids? And because she has a different view than I have, we're not fighting. We are arguing. And we're putting, we're putting arguments up. I, I, I like to tell the story, like in the Philippines, they have this thing that when it rains, you cannot go out. You get sick in the rain. And it's, just, it's one of the things they believe. In Sweden, if it snows, we, we put our kids out, like go out and play in the snow. It's good for you. So now in Singapore, and now it's raining, can, what, can they go out? Can they not go out? Like, which one should they be here? And now she has to argue. Why do they get sick in the rain? Oh, it's because they get a cold. I go, Elaine, it's 28 degrees in Singapore. You don't get a cold in 28 degrees. It never gets 28 degrees in Sweden. So we would have a cold every day if that was true. Uh, and then so, she realized, you know what, it's, it's just, it's, it's a lie. Most likely this comes from the fact that you don't go out and rain in the rain because the thunder might come and the thunder might kill you. It might come from something like this. And our kids cannot go out if it's thunder, but they can now go out if it's raining because we, she realized you don't get sick in the rain. So she changed the fundamental truth that she had. And the next time I will change the fundamental truth that I have about like why kids should respect old people. In Sweden, we don't show respect for old people like they do in Asia. And now I think it's so wrong. Of course we should do this. So we are raising our kids to show respect for the elders. I think it's a really nice and beautiful thing to do. So the idea of having someone 
who is on the same level as you, but has a totally different point of view. It could be political, it could be cultural, whatever it is, but have someone who is equal to you, but an opposing point of view, is, the, is such a beautiful way of getting you to change your mind. So that, that was my answer, but now, so to what can you help me with? I'm going to say that you can help me. All of us, all yeah. of us all who of are you, listening right yeah, now. I get it. Okay, so maybe I'll do that this. Uh, I, I, so this project of raising my kids, I call it helping, helping uh, strangers. What did I call it? Letting strangers raise my kids. That's what I call the, this project, but I contact people who know something and, and ask them to record a video for my kids about whatever they know that I don't know. So if they can connect me with anyone or if they themselves want to do a video about anything that in my kids, they are, five, they are almost five, seven and nine something that they should know, something that they can teach my kids. And then they send that to me as a video and I will show every video for every day to my kids that I get with a, uh, an introduction about that person. Uh, it's, my email is frederick at interesting.org. Frederick at, in, or, or, we, or you can put info at interesting.org or hello at interesting or anything. In, anything at interesting.org. Interesting interesting that's your email domain? That is my email domain. Oh, that is correct. That's awesome. You can put anything in front of it. You can put gill at interesting.org or hello at uh, gin and tonic at interesting. Anything comes to me. So uh, send that video to me or connect with me with someone who has something to teach children. That would be, that would be amazing. That would be such a cool way of, of helping to serve school my kids. I love that. Wow. And I, I, I would love to add to that two things. Number one, if your kids ever want to learn about networking, you know who to come to. Uh, yeah, but so the other thing... I think it's such a beautiful social project to find a way to put this online and get other parents to want to click and say, I'd like this guy to teach my kids or that girl to teach my kids. I think that's a really awesome startup waiting to happen. So if anyone's listening to Frederick and you want to collaborate with the Creativity Explorer, who's going to be receiving a lot of videos of people that want to teach us three awesome kids, this is a billion dollar idea waiting to be launched. Wow. Please. Yeah, that's amazing. Frederick, really, really appreciate your time today. My team sent me another 30 questions. And I know that speaking to you in the past, I could talk to you for a long time. And today I was trying to balance it out between asking you questions to serve everyone else and asking you questions that are completely serving me and our companies and the challenges we're going through. But I think so many people in our community are in similar positions right now. Entrepreneurs who are either struggling to be creative and struggling to innovate and struggling to look for solutions and look for that wind, that opportunity that would take them in the right way because there's a lot of uncertainty. You know, is there any last messages that you'd like to share with our awesome audiences out there about, you know, creativity and innovation and, you know, finding that, that wind that would take you towards the solutions that you need? Well, yes, I, the opportunity message is, is always powerful, but maybe the, the go back to the explorer definition to, to venture into unknown territory in order to learn more about it, uh, to help you become more creative. You, I'm the creativity explorer. You are the, you are something else, but to explore the world, to venture into unknown territory in order to learn more about it. That is, I think that is the secret to a life well lived. So I, I encourage people to explore more, whatever area that might be in. Beautiful. Well, thank you for your time today. Thank you for this great conversation. I, I look forward to making sure that all the leaders in our community and important people out there who are looking for, you know, inspiration from an outstanding Swede who's traveled the world in this, uh, the creativity explorer that could really make a big difference in such challenging times are going to be listening to this. Thank you once again for your time. Thank you everyone who's listening to our awesome speaker today, the creativity explorer, Frederick Heron, that's coming to us live from Singapore. Frederick, thank you again for joining the Collective Genius Code podcast. Really, really enjoyed it. I see we have a comment from a couple of people that joined us on Zoom. And we have quite a few comments on Facebook as well, but this is gonna go very soon up on our podcast. And I look forward to people to connecting with you. If they do wanna connect with you personally, where would they find you? 
Uh, uh, LinkedIn is by far. I don't know if you can see them. I, the, is my name visible there? I guess Frederick Heron. Uh, Frederick Heron, H A R E N. Uh, yeah, LinkedIn. I know. They, they'll, they'll make sure to see it everywhere. Wherever we post it, LinkedIn. we'll make sure to put your LinkedIn information as well. Is there any other specific website that you would want to send people to that you think is important for them to check you out? Uh, just go to link, connect with me on LinkedIn. That is, I find that I, I really like LinkedIn. That's where I'm active. That's where I'm posting my creativity uh, content and the interviews that I've done and everything. So if you want to discover your full creative potential, follow me on LinkedIn. That's the easiest. Beautiful. And what I do tell people, if you're going to follow Frederick, then do that. If you're going to connect with him, please make sure to send him a personal message. Don't just press connect. Send him a nice personal message. Tell him something you appreciate about him. Tell him what you heard about him and tell him why you want to connect with this genius. Beautiful. Frederick, thank you once again. I look forward to seeing you very, very soon, either in Singapore, potentially here in Bali. Look forward to, looking you. forward to our community serving you soon. So we're now not offline. We're not online anymore. We're not live. That was really, really cool. Thank you, Frederick, so, so much. Uh, cool. I, I hope that went according to maybe some expectations. Yeah, that was fun. Good. Uh, we, we have a lot of fun. Our team is going to break it up uh, into, a, uh, a few, and, into the recording, and then they'll take out a few segments from it that they'll, serve, uh, they'll share on social media. Uh, if there is any specific links except for LinkedIn, link for the book, for example, uh, link for anything link. else. One, one call to action. Get them to connect with LinkedIn, and then after that, I can tell them whatever you want. Okay. Awesome. Beautiful. Thank you so, so much again for today. And if there's anything good, else that uh, I could personally do for you, you let me know. Send my regards to your beautiful wife uh, and uh, hope to see you in Bali soon. Yeah, I hope you guys come visit. I don't think we're coming to Singapore in the near, near future because currently we're not allowed, but hopefully you guys can come and visit us here as well. Yeah, I hope they can open up what you call those corridors where you can start flying a little bit. Yeah, they will soon. Soon, soon. Yeah. All right. Take care. Good stuff. Thank you. Take Good care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.